Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Michaela Adams, and I am a member of the Center for Threat Informed Defense. Um, the Center for Threat Informed Defense is committed to cybersecurity research and furthering threat informed defense globally. I was the technical project lead or co-technical project lead for a project the center funded called Summoning the Pyramid, which we refer to as STP. And I have here with me today, Jacob Shore. He is the North American XDR practice lead for Accenture. So thank you so much for joining me today, Jacob. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mickey. Awesome. So I guess before we jump into it, I'd love to learn a little bit more about what your role is within Accenture and what you're responsible sure. for on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I run our XDR practice for North America. Um, really, that just means I have to do the business stuff while everyone else gets to do the fun stuff. Uh, we handle everything from, um, you know, your typical endpoint security um, implementations with NGAV, EDR, FIM, all of those, as well as we've had um, a lot of engagements around um, specialized threat research and detection engineering, um, threat coverage assessments um, and get wells um, and um, like endpoint security transformation projects. Yeah, it's definitely a lot to handle. And I know one of one of the things you mentioned was being able to handle all that detection within, I'm sure, the Accenture environment and within your client environments as well. So based on your work and your many hats that you wear, um, what has been the biggest struggle in building out these detections for all of these environments that you're responsible for? There, there's a couple things. Um, I'd say probably number one, um, it's really difficult to give clients an accurate sense of their their threat detection coverage. Um, we've had a challenge for quite a while with, um, by the way, we love MITRE ATT&CK, don't get me wrong, um, really great framework for, before y'all kick me off. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love it. Uh, one thing has been uh, challenging is the the um, is accurately tracking coverage on it. Um, it. Everything is kind of treated the same. We've had a lot of cases where, um, you know, you see these heat maps in every single vendor product, right? Um, every every service provider shows it, and um, yeah, it, it shows basically like a count of the detection rules per tactic or in technique. Um, and it, it can be really misleading is once we dig into it, um, you know, the quality can vary greatly, but clients have this sense that, Hey, we're protected. I saw a pretty green color. So that means no one's going to hurt me. Um, one egregious example we were talking about earlier. Um, we, we recently saw a client that had, uh, their coverage for, and correct me, I, I, I'm forgetting the exact name of the uh, technique, but, um, uh, exploiting external services, uh, network services. Um, their, their only coverage was from a rule from, I believe like 2008 for, um, yeah, common worm ports of 2008. And it hadn't been touched in, in literally 15 years. Um, but Hey, it showed up as, you know, light green on the miter attack heat map. So they just been assuming that they were good to go. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's really challenging to give them a true sense of where they're at and where they need to go. Um, additionally, um, on that note, there's just a, a huge lack of, uh, we call it resilient, y'all call it robust, um, robust content, resilient content from security vendors and service providers. Um, even when we do see security vendors um, quickly respond to emerging threats, um, oftentimes is at a very low STP level. Um, and it's just not very effective. It has to constantly be updated. Um, and it's just not... Um, yeah, it, it it misses a lot, um, and like you said, like I said, there's a lot of overhead. Additionally, uh, we started when we implemented this. I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. Um, we started using STP to help define the um, shelf life or, or the expiration date for these detection rules, um, and we found that you know if we assume that a threat actor can get past a detection rule, um, if, if they're really focusing on it within a few weeks or a few months and the detection rule hasn't been even updated or looked at in years, it's probably not gonna be effective. If we assume that you know the threat actors are being diligent and they're intelligent people that want to break in, it's probably not good enough and it needs to be retested. Um, so we see a lot of outdated and, and broken content. Yeah, and I think that's a very important point to bring up and something that's, it's 
nice to see validated in a way from your experience. I'm sure like a lot of other people experience it as well, where they say they might say they have coverage against a certain technique, but when in reality, it's not hitting that technique level, but in reality, it's hitting those lower level indicators of compromise. And that's what we really tried to focus on with, with summoning the pyramid. You know, we took David Bianco's pyramid of pain as inspiration and tried to figure out a way where we could measure the level of effort needed by an adversary to evade detections at certain levels. You know, we had, we were able to produce that matrix that had the, the two dimensions to it, you know, analytic robustness, one to five score of being able to detect those ephemeral values. Um, those low level IOCs that are very easy to evade versus yeah. as you go towards a level five, something that is a lot more difficult to evade, which is the whole of a technique. Yeah. And then also being able to better understand how an adversary can evade certain detections throughout the operating system. Um, so I know you were starting to mention this previously, but you were able to integrate summoning the pyramid into some of your detection work. Um, how did you go about doing that? And what was your success um, with, with being able to do that? Sure. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, it, it's funny, we had actually tried to operationalize the pyramid of pain for a few years and really just did not see a lot of success. Um, it, we did it pretty much one for one. So we were like, okay, here are the hashes, here are the IP addresses, DNS. Um, and it, it was, it was um, I think honestly kind of cluttered um, and really confusing for clients who had, you know, we're coming from like legacy antivirus. They all they know are about our hashes and then really to have a framework for what a good detection is versus a bad um, or, or poor quality. So, um, yeah, we, we had used it internally and just really struggled to get adoption with clients. Uh, more technical clients um, agreed, but it, it, yeah, it was, it was difficult to find kind of a unified um, framework for measuring and tracking this. Um, and then we, we happened to stumble on, uh, so yeah, MITRE CTIDs, um, summoning the pyramid framework. And it was like, we all had a, a collective like light bulb moment. Uh, we're like, this is, um, exactly what we've been looking for. Also, this was our first exposure to your center. Um, so right off the bat, we were like threat informed defense. Like that's exactly what we've been trying to get at this whole time. Um, yeah, it, it was great. Like everything clicked. And then we're like, this is, this is what we've been trying to do for years. Um, it just really struggled to get traction. I love that y'all condensed those ephemeral um, IOCs, like you said, um, and, and included a lot of the like network and host artifacts, like the port numbers uh, and file names. It, it made just a ton of sense. And I love that you split out the tools um, into like the, the um, adversary broad and um, pre-existing tools that helped describe a lot, um, or that was really helpful when describing um, the differences between um, you know, malware versus an exploited internal tool to clients. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, so we, um, sorry, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember the question uh, <laughs> that you asked. I just started going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> um, no, did that answer your question? Keep, keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. And I, I think what, what's really cool to hear about all that is like, I think we, when we were first starting the project, we had a similar idea, you know, one-to-one -one pyramid of pain, um, but it didn't get into the level of depth needed to be able to effectively score how difficult wow. it was for an adversary to evade those certain analytics. Yeah. And like what you were mentioning before with the shelf life, like, I think that is a very interesting thing to think about, especially when you're looking at, maybe some lower level indicators that might may have a shorter shelf life compared to yeah. like some at the technique level. Um, yeah. But I guess going off of that, um, since you have been able to integrate summoning the pyramid, what has been the biggest improvement within your detection environment? Yeah. Um, oh man, there's so many. Um, harping real quick on, on what you're describing with the, uh, the, the artifacts. I think this is the first time we've had uh, kind of a, a complete buy-in across the business. Um, I can, I, I have these training sessions that I'll do with our, our marketing and salespeople, and I'll actually pull up an industry response to a major threat like Hermetic Wiper and show all the different security vendors, how they actually respond to the detection logic. And then we walk through, okay, hey, you're the attacker. How would you get past this? There's always this kind of like aha moment when people look at a, um, they look at some of the detections for like, wizard.dll and they're like oh i just renamed that I'm like great you just completely bypassed the detection content for this major security vendor 
congrats. Like, like you're a marketing intern, you have no security experience, and you just bypass thousands of customer security. That's not a great, like, it's scary how, how bad the problem can be. Um, so sorry. Anyway, segue, that segues to, uh, you know, some of the improvements we've seen, um, it really helps us find that outdated detection content that needs to be updated. Um, if we kind of give that shelf life. So if we think, you know, STP two and three content, it has a shelf life of a, a, a couple of weeks or a couple of days. Um, that tells us we need to check on that frequently. We need to see if the threat actor has modified anything and revalidate. Um, it might be great coverage initially while we're doing a deeper dive into the threat, um, but it's not a um, end ending point. Um, it's also helped us. Um, yeah, it, it, it's also helped us um, identif identify great detection rules that have been held back by low STP conditions that are tied to it. Uh, we found a lot of detection rules that are really well written. And then it's like, and the hash must be X, Y, and Z. And you're like, you're so close to being a great detection rule. You you almost made it, but now this is basically useless. I changed the hash. Cool. I just bypassed the whole thing. Um, it's helped keep the, like, uh, helped us clean up a lot of content, um, you know, consolidate IOC lists and things like that. Um, and, and kind of differentiate between, um, you know, IOC feeds versus a detection rule. Um, depending on who you ask, that's not always, um, you know, easy for folks to differentiate. Um, a couple other, you know, a couple other improvements we've seen. Um, what we've noticed is that resilient detection rules require a lot less overhead over time. Um, and they improve our ability to effectively respond to these emerging threats. Um, that, that hermetic wiper example I gave, uh, we were looking at our, our MXDR coverage and seeing if we had, you know, an effective response to this. And we had some really great detection rules, STP-5. And um, two years later, they're still firing. They're still working exactly the way we want them to. And we actually went through, you know, the procedures listed in Meyer Attack um, back, you know, 10 years, and they would have effectively caught all these different, um, these different uh, procedures uh, that gives you a lot of peace of mind. You're no longer, um, yeah, constantly reacting. You, it gives us the ability to be more proactive. Um, I, I know I've like jumped on the soapbox a bit with this when we talked earlier. Um, I hate the narrative that we can't be proactive in threat research and detection engineering. The conversation is always, you know, there's always emerging threats. There's always something new. We're always chasing our tail. We'll never get ahead of it. Um, and we're saying that you actually can, uh, like if you build strong coverage, um, you don't have to have a fire drill every single time there's a threat. You can quickly validate that coverage, ensure that it still works, and then prioritize your efforts on the, the other gaps that you've identified. Speaking of, so we have these engagements, you know, where we've, we've assessed the client, we understand um, what their security posture looks like. And um, one of the ways that we help them get um, rapidly get better is, uh, we've started adopting the choke point methodology that that uh, that y'all um, built out. You know, multiple threat actors that are targeting them, um, funneling through a particular TTP. Um, that's a really great opportunity for one STP five level detection rule to really lock down a lot of those kill chains. It's also in in some areas like cloud and OT, where the the number of TTPs is a lot smaller. Um, we've we've called it for the last few years like moat coverage. We're like, okay, hey, if lateral movement is, if we can effectively catch all lateral movement, um, you know, with, with a handful of detection rules or a few dozen, then at least we know there's a bad guy there. Uh, we're not going to be surprised. We're not going to have, you know, a hundred day dwell time and then be shocked when the entire environment's ransomed. We'll at least know they're here and then engage IR to start investigating. Um, even as we did that historically, that we didn't have a lot of confidence that we really truly had created a true moat um, versus you know, like a little wading pool or a creek. Um, you're like, how deep is this coverage? Are there other ways around it? Um, using this framework really gives us a lot more confidence that um, we've truly kind of built this wall um, that will, or trip wire um, that'll work in, in all these different scenarios. Yeah, and it, it's great to hear not only how subbing the pyramid has been able to change the way you go about building out these detections, but also the way you think about resilient coverage and how you think about yeah. defense against 
emerging threats or even just building on the knowledge that you know now. And I do want to hit on the point you made earlier about being more proactive and being able to do threat sure. research. And I think that's a very big point of the center is being able to change the game on the adversary in a way, be able yeah. to dive deep into what an adversary is actually doing so we can better defend ourselves. Um, so I guess just to, to, to finish up, and I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but you know, summoning the pyramids out there, um, how do you think the thinking around building robust detections will, will change the way the security community thinks about you know, threat research and, and yeah. maybe other security concepts down the road? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. Um, it definitely hasn't changed our internal um, mindset around it. Um, as we've seen, we we've started kind of championing detection transparency. Um, our theory is that it's a lot like um, encryption algorithms. You don't have a secret hidden encryption algorithm. You have the entire industry um, it, it, like test and review the encryption algorithm, ensure that it can't be broken, and then you you can trust it. We're doing something similar with our detection rules where we're having a lot more people participate in the detection development life cycle. Um, we're having a lot more transparency around um, how those are developed because if they are truly effective, we don't need to rely on secrecy to block a threat actor. Um, it's much more difficult for them to bypass it. And on that note, um, we think that'll, we really, really do think that that it's going to spread to the broader community. Um, we're investing a lot, assuming that it'll spread to the broader community. Um, for a really long time, clients have always complained that, um, you know, their service providers and their security vendors um, are a bit of a black box. Like they don't know what their coverage is. They don't know if they're protected. Emerging threat happens. You send in a support ticket. They respond a few days later and you hope that they tested it right. Um, there's a lot of um, trust required in that relationship. And we think that we're going to start seeing um, uh, vendors and security uh, uh, service providers um, show a lot more de uh, detection coverage transparency, showing where the coverage lies, the resiliency of that coverage. Uh, we think that the smart vendors were act will actually leverage that as like a uh, key market advantage. If you can say, hey, we can show you exactly what our coverage is and how great it is, these other guys won't even show you. Like they're scared to have any accountability. Um, it's a lot easier to, to, uh, to um, win over that business. Um, I also think in general, I think clients will become a lot more knowledgeable about their threat detection uh, coverage posture. We saw that with MITRE ATT&CK, they had a lot more um, um, knowledge and there's a lot more intelligent conversations around the way that attacks happen. I think the same thing is gonna happen around threat detection. Um, we're gonna see them asking more of the right questions and um, prioritizing coverage. Um, I think that we're going to finally start seeing people move away from EDR being seen as like an antivirus that's supposed to catch all the things and more like a threat detection engineering content development platform for um, building that threat detection content. Yeah, and I think you you hit the nail on the head for sure. I think we're, we're better together as a security community being yeah. able to share with each other what makes our defenses you know, win against adversaries and yeah. hopefully summoning the pyramid and the work you've done and you've been able to demonstrate showcases, you know, the proof that we need that more. Um, so that was all the questions I had. I'm going to plug the summoning the pyramid website. Yeah. So if, if anyone has anything to contribute to the website in, in terms of scores for analytics that are out in, in the open web, um, or just anything else to contribute in terms of ideas, please reach out to um, the Center for Threat Informed Defense. We'd be happy to hear more. Um, but Jacob, thank you so much for taking the time today. And it was great to hear your experiences and what you're doing to make the, the security community safe. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michaela. It was great talking with you. Again.